Hello and welcome everyone to another Hot and Holistic and we are on a new platform today so we hope that you'll be able to give us feedback about whether you like this format or the Spreecast format and we'll make sure you have all the information to chime in and let us know. Um, but in the meantime, we are thrilled to have with us today, we have Danish Ahmed. He does a, spy, uh, a site for Inspired Living. Um, and he's an entrepreneur, he's a motivational speaker, he's an educator. Boy, there's probably a whole bunch more titles in there that I'm missing, but those mm -hmm. are the main ones. And we're thrilled to have Danish join us today, and along with Siobhan John, one of our regulars, you know her face. So thanks again, Danish, for joining us this week. Thank you, Tash. It's awesome to be here. Oh man, I don't even know where to start. Actually, one of the first places I'd like you to start is um, you have an app, and uh, let me get the name right again. Um, it's called the. It's from Ordinary Words, which is your website, www.ordinarywords.com. But it's called the Inspired Living App. Is that right? Yes, I'm promoting the Inspired Living App, which is. That, uh, go ahead. No, I want you to tell us all about it. You were doing exactly what we needed. <laughs> awesome. It, it, it's I like to say it's like Netflix for personal development. So anyone who uh, lives a life where they always want to grow as a person, become a better person, uh, feel better, uh, be in shape, uh, be the type of person that's up to stuff and wanting to make their lives uh, and for the lives of the people in the community better, this app delivers video content. So it's... Um, it's like six to nine minute videos every single week and it's on their smartphone whether it's an iPhone or an Android I think um, our society is, is such that where we need to get to people when they are in idle time when they're waiting uh, at a lineup or uh, waiting for an appointment that's when people need to see this type of content because that's the only time they have and it needs to, it needs to be quick and it needs to be multimedia it needs to be visual it needs to be engaging and with an app it can also be interactive and I think that's the key to really make shifts in our lives and to grow a community of people who are committed to personal development. Love that, love that. And since mm -hmm. we're talking about inspired living and you know you've got the six to nine minute videos, we we before we get into this, because I'm not sure people who might be watching this understand or know or are familiar with your story. I know that we live in the same city and I didn't even know you were <laughs> out there. Yeah. So talk about your entire story, how you actually came to start being an inspiration yourself. Wow. Well, you know, the challenge is I have many stories. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard to get all those stories. Well, Danish, you <laughs> tell whichever ones. We got an hour. We're good to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so feel free as I, as I share whatever comes to my mind if you want to take me down a certain path. For sure. Uh, uh, so, yeah, let, 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 guide the story as you will. So um, I was actually born not in Toronto but in uh, Karachi, Pakistan, um, uh, and I was living with uh, with my family, and we were living in an impoverished state without any electricity, without any running water, and and so in that kind of situation, you know, my parents, you know, they don't know what it's like to have a person with albinism. Uh, they're worried about food and how to just keep us alive. They don't realize, like I, so I didn't realize that my sight was limited. You know, you, you just know what you know when, when you don't have something, you don't know you have it until you learn that you right. don't have it through life. And so I started, when we, my, my father um, borrowed enough money to bring himself to Toronto and then he worked here for several years uh, with several jobs so he could save up enough money to bring the rest of us here. And we lived on welfare and in, in an impoverished state, uh, state and it was, it was challenging because I got to learn about my, my disability through ridicule and at school, through bullying, through abuse, and not being able to fit into that system, that system of not being able to see what's on the blackboard and and learning academically, or not being able to look into people's eyes or smile at them and connect with them at a social level, or not to be able to go across the street to, to the store and just be functional. Uh, so all those things are really challenging, and I say to people, you know, it's not just having one disability, it's having multitude of, of challenges because uh, not only can I not see, I'm legally blind, um, but with having this kind of skin condition, when I look look different, I'm also 
socially isolated or scare people or, or people, you know, fear being around me for, for whatever reason, doesn't matter, that's how it is. And, um, and then also because of the lack of pigmentation in my skin, I can't be out in the sun for too long. So that restricts my outdoor activities and being social or functional that way. I remember this story, um, I, I say it's a story of my life, <laughs> but I say it's a story, I, I tell these stories all the time. Uh, um, when I was in grade three, and I, I, mean, I didn't know what it was like to be an albino, uh, so I just went out on a school trip and, to a swimming pool, and I swam outside all day, thinking nothing of it because everybody else was. And when I came home um, that evening, my, you know, my skin was irritating me, but by, by the nighttime, I had blisters on my shoulders about three inches high, um, and I couldn't lie down or go to sleep. And for the next three weeks, I had to deal with those blisters, and my skin was peeling, and it was gross and nasty and uncomfortable and painful and traumatic. Um, but then you know, that made me realize that I can't stay in the sun for too long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the whole day. Um, so uh, yeah, all those challenges growing up, I was so uh, fortunate or blessed or lucky or however one chooses to look at it to um, to have this faith inside of me saying saying that you know life couldn't be this bad that God couldn't have just been a sadist there must be some deeper meaning to this so I tried different things I tried talking to guidance counselors I tried talking to my friends uh, and I tried making a difference but none of that it was really working. I mean, I was sent to a psychiatrist, and I was taking antidepressants, and um, and I didn't I didn't feel any of it helped. I mean, some of it made me worse. But I kept trying, and in my in my search, and I think really that's the key to everything is you just keep trying. Um, something else is what life is about. You know, you fail half the time, or most of yes. the time, and you you keep going. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and out of my 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 ability to keep going. At the age of 14, I came across uh, a program late night on television, an infomercial, um, and that program said, hey, you can change your life. You can uh, be inspired. You can make a difference. And what I loved about that, it, it wasn't just one person saying it. It was people from all walks of life with all different backgrounds, famous people, people you didn't know, all saying this. And I said to myself, how could that be true? Because the world in my mind was a horrible place and it wasn't great and not worth living. And yet these people look like they're living great, happy, successful lives. And were telling me that I could too. So I invested in that program and, you know, my destination didn't shift overnight, but my direction shifted overnight, mm. uh, as Jim Rohn said. And what started to happen is as I listened to that stuff, I started asking myself different questions. I started thinking a different way. I started... Um, having new thoughts, different thoughts, that were all about how do I make my life better as opposed to why does my life suck. And, and you know, you know it, what, if, if I can get you, because that's, for me, that's the perfect area that we need you to go on. Okay. Because, um, one of the things that we always talk about, and we've brought it up on a few of our shows right now, so Hot and Holistic, the whole idea from um, of the show came from Siobhan and I sitting for, for tea one day, and we were talking about you know this connected living and and questioning what's something more and how can we contribute to that and as the show evolves we've always had such a difficult time getting men in particular to um, see holistic living and in, in that connected living and the spiritual living as something that they thought was theirs because you know we we got so much feedback saying oh that's a woman thing so mm -hmm. I, I want you to to talk about what was the shift that you saw when you went from before and to after when you started questioning what the something more was and starting to get connected and and inspiring others and being inspired yourself well I was asking uh, questions in a different way or, or asking questions rather than making statements, rather than making judgments, I made observations. And it sounds like, uh, I think for some people, that might sound like this syntax, or very subtle, but it's, it's like a world of difference. Mm. Um, even, in it, even just to, when you think something, to realize that it's not the truth. 
that it's my feeling right now, uh, in this moment, that's how I am perceiving, that's what I'm thinking, but that doesn't mean it's true all the time. I may feel really bad right now, and life might suck right now, but life doesn't always suck. Uh, <laughs> And, and yeah, and that, I think it's just because because if you tell someone life is, when they're going through a moment that life sucks, and you tell them no, life is beautiful, they say no, it's not. So it's not about getting them to go from night to day. It's to say you know life does suck right now, mm -hmm. and I think that's part of the secret is is it's acknowledging people for where they are. And you know it was funny because I think lots of times when people are depressed uh, or upset, what other people try to do is to try to take them out of that, uh, yeah. you know, out, out of for good intention. But they're trying to make them wrong and saying you shouldn't be there, you should be happy, and and they're just saying they're not being related to. They feel like well you don't understand me, you're right. you're you don't get me. Of, of my it, it is difficult, and you're not acknowledging that it's difficult for me. But instead of trying to make people happy when they're depressed, just validate their depression. And you know that and and you know it's an art because you know one of my favorite quotes is for. Every profound truth, the opposite is another profound truth. And I think the problem usually occurs when people go to one extreme. If you keep validating someone's depression over and over again, they'll stay depressed. But it, it's all about acknowledging where they are and then helping them to move out of it. But if you try helping them to move out of it before you acknowledge where they are, then they don't feel like they've been understood. They yeah, there's a the resistance passion. there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That. And that's, where com that's what compassion is. Compassion is first relating to the other person and then you can help them grow and move out of that. I love that. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's just pure gold, Dinesh. Like, seriously, I just I love the fact that you talk about when people are having these emotions to acknowledge where they are. Because I think that's something we forget. And you, you touched upon something key is that the natural you know, inclination is to, I want to help you. And no, everything's great. You know, <laughs> you should be happy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. We all have those days, and sometimes you just want a, someone to say, "Yeah, it sucks," and I agree with you. <laughs> and it's okay. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I, I love that you've been able because I think that does help because in the end, like people just want to feel that you empathize with them, and they don't want to feel that you're judging them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um. So that's so that's such a key message. I I really love that you're able to share that with us. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, people want to feel connected, and and different yes. people feel connected in different ways. And that's why I always talk about one thing that's important to do is to first to listen or to know people and find out what medium they like supporting because people like supporting different mediums. Mm -hmm. They like it uh, in different ways. Mm -hmm. So for for example, I mean, there's different learning styles. Some people like are more kinesthetic and they like touch. And so you can relate to them just when they're down by, by touching their shoulder or, mm -hmm. or, or, or caressing them or something like that. Uh, where other people are auditory. Some people are, are visual. And what we try to do, I think, uh, uh, when we find something that works, we think that thing is going to work for everybody. And yeah. so we try to use it on everybody rather than realizing, wait a minute, that worked for me and it's great because that means it can work for other people too. But it doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody. Right. And, and my job is to, to discover different things that work for different people so I can relate to more people, so I can connect with more people. And the more people I connect with and relate to, the more reach and uh, I will have, and the more of a difference I'll make. Absolutely, absolutely. There's no one size fits all for connection. Exactly. <laughs> I love that. You know what? I'm going to turn that into a quote after this is done too, because that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, and speaking of no one size fits all for connection, um, let's talk about you know your gifts, Danish, because again, you do so much. You do speaking engagements, you, you know, you, you, um, you have this app that you're working on, you run your own business. What do you feel are your gifts? That's a, a great question. I think um, my gifts are my adversities. So I, a great, really great quote I heard is that people don't become successful despite their challenges; they become successful because of them. And wow. the the real trick, therefore, in life, that being true, is to turn our disadvantages into our advantages. And when we do that, then we have so much power that was in the unseen. Uh, and as as an example, for me, when I was growing up, I felt very frustrated that. 
people could recognize me instantly because I'm, you know, I'm different, and they can see me <laughs> up from a crowd, and they always know I'm, I can't sneak up on people or, you know, try to <laughs> try to pretend. I, even like Halloween really sucked. Every time I wear a costume, people know it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well let's use that. You'll be, and so I couldn't recognize people, and it was frustrating that when I network and go out, and I'll see someone, and I won't know if I know them from before. So it's hard to make a connection, and sometimes it's awkward because they expect me to remember them, and they feel like, how come I don't, because they don't understand that I can't see. Uh, so, you know, I put the two together and said, okay, well, if I can't recognize people, and people are going to always recognize me, let me just make sure I go to as many networking events as possible and show my face around so that I'll come to a point that all these movers and shapers will know who I am. Well, I think and, you do that uh, really effectively. Let me tell you, I found you. So. <laughs> we got you over here on this show. So, yeah, no, that works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it sounds like it was well, uh, probably a, a, um, a journey for you to, to get from a place where, you know, you saw what made you different and embrace it. That, that, would, that must have been a journey, right? Or did you just wake up overnight and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I got this. I'm going to use this. <laughs> well, it's, 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 I think it's like life is more like a sine wave. You know, you go back yes. and forth and figure the art out. Uh, for, for an example, like, you know, when I was growing up, I wanted to be, I, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to stand out and be different. I wanted to fit in. And so instead of fitting in, uh, because I already looked different visually, I didn't want to tell people that I was blind as well. <laughs> Create wow. another barrier. So I tried to uh, pretend that I wasn't, which was great because it made me uh, much more functional. It made me integrate into society very much more efficiently than having to go to a special school and having to read Braille and all that sort of stuff, which something wrong with that, but I wanted to, I wanted to be, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to like go to regular school and, and be in, in, in that kind of culture. But I did that so effectively that when I made new friends as, as an adolescent, that people had no clue that I, I couldn't see. And, and one of my friends, as I was doing speaking engagements, he said to me, you know, you talk about authenticity and transparency and all that, and you can lie to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? He said, all these, you have all these friends, and they don't even know that you can't see. And wow. I <laughs> And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? You know, when, when they ask me, I'll tell them the truth. I don't lie to them. And, and this is another interesting distinction around transparency. Just because you're not lying to someone doesn't mean you're being transparent. Um, and he said, yeah, but, you know, you don't tell them soon in the relationship. And I said, I don't want that to be my first sentence when I meet someone. I, you know, that's my name. And by the way, I'm blind because I didn't want to identify me holistically. And, and so I had to, but he was right because there were people who said, you know, when they found out that I couldn't see, they were actually offended because they thought, why didn't I share something so intimate in, with them because I'm their friend? Or why didn't I ask for their support, their help when I needed it? Or if I uh, they didn't tell them the truth about this thing, what else could I be hiding from them? And so I, I realized, again, it was back to the artist. I'm not going to tell someone immediately. But also, I want to be able to share something like that with someone organically at the right time as opposed to keeping it from them. Because the longer I keep it from them, the, the more of an issue it will actually become. Wow. That seems like a very, um, you know, that's, that's a hard line to walk, <laughs> you know. And, uh, wow, I don't even know how I would deal with having that because that seems like a, a big responsibility in a way right I mean on one hand you want to fit in and people can't tell like even me sitting here looking at you I would never know unless you said something that you were blind mm. right so it's like yeah. w when when do you bring that up and and right. the thing that comes to me is that there's a certain amount of understanding that you have to accept people and um, one of the things that I know, um, you know, you talk about, and I've watched quite a few of your um, speaking engagements on YouTube, is that you're very open, and I really think, and part of the reason we do this show 
is to have people people to be open and not to get into that judgmental phase because a lot of us can do that, right? It's like all of a sudden, if somebody didn't tell you something about them, it's like, oh, well, what? You too good to tell me what's really going on? But it's just like, no, if it's not organically the right time to bring up, um, you know, a certain, something sensitive maybe that's about you, then it's just, you know, you have to judge the right time. And I wish we get to a point where as human beings in culture and society, we can um, kind of be, be more open to how, you know, we're all individuals and we communicate in our own unique way. So to stop getting so sensitive about things like that, it's like, okay, well, it wasn't the right time. All right, I'm good. So you told me now. I'm thankful. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, but again, this is why we do this show, so we can have these discussions. Um, as you go through and, you know, you do your speaking engagements, what is your feedback? Like, what is usually the biggest comment that you get from people who interact with you and work with you in your, your work? It's that, that was so inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> Love it! <laughs> And and you know it's it's it, it's interesting because um, you know be, being inspired is great and that's awesome but you know there's a distinction between being inspired and then making behavioral shifts in your life right and I know that you know there's a lot of people I inspire and then I meet them a year later and they haven't taken the actions that they told me they were going to take um, yeah. and you know a lot of it I think comes back to this is one of the things I talk about it is uh, listening and listening in a different way. I think most people, when they listen, they're always looking listening to it superficially. So, for example, uh, in the last example that we just shared about, um, you know, me, me, when do I tell someone about my albinism? And someone might listen to, to that and they say, well, you know, I'm not albino. Does <laughs> that relate to me? And 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 what we want to teach people is how to listen to that. Is well, is there something else that's about you? That you're not telling people, right. and there's lots of things that uh, you know that come into that domain. Whether I just just throw some examples out there to trigger people, it could be having asthma, it could be uh, being diabetic, it could be being gay or lesbian, it could you know. And there's all sorts of challenges that people have in their lives, and you know when, when I talk about my challenges, I you know I don't do that to to say look at me. I want to do that to say look at everybody. We all yes. have these challenges. The difference is I just am transparent about all of them and talk about all of them all the time. Wow. And, and as you say that, I can think of so many situations even, you know, with people that I know of. And, again, that's such a good point about um, superficial listening because I mm -hmm. think, um, you know, in society now, that has become the norm. Like mm. you know, you, I, we all go to a lot of networking events, and you've been there where you know you're saying to somebody, "Oh, and you know, what do you do?" And they'll tell you, and then they're you know they ask the question back, but they're not listening. So you can tell yeah. them, you know, you're King Kong sitting at the top of the Empire State Building, and they'll be like, "Oh yeah, that's." <laughs> <laughs> well, I try to catch people off guard. So when when they say, "What do you do?" I always try making up something new. Um, or sometimes I go into one of my uh, little phrases, like when they say, "What do you What do you do?" I say, "As little as possible." <laughs> <laughs> and so those that are listening usually laugh, which is great. <laughs> yeah, I might have to work on that one. That's an amazing That's answer. A good one. That's a good one. So, Siobhan, did you have any questions? Because, I mean, I could go on. Do you have any questions for Danny? Um, well, I, what you mentioned about, like, listening and getting people to sort of, you know, take that opportunity to not just hear the first thing. Do you have any other advice for people, like, that they all hear something and they get inspired or motivated and they're going to say, I'm going to go and I'm going to do this, and then they stall? You know, like, they're saying, I went to this speech and I heard you speak and I'm going to go and I'm going to change my life, but... For whatever ha reason, something happens, and then it just—it's like nothing ever happened, and they kind of regress. Like, do you have any advice for folks who might be kind of going through that? Because they might be having maybe inspiration fatigue, as I like to call it. Like they'll go <laughs> and they'll, they'll be inspired, 
and then later they're just like, oh, I'm tired, yeah. and then they have to go back and get another fix, you know? So right. it's like they're constantly on that inspiration roller coaster where they're inspired every couple months, but then they're never really maintaining that momentum. So do you have any advice for mm -hmm. folks to kind of take, who, you know, they, they take something and they get the lessons, but they, how, how can they keep going? Right. I, I think the, the thing that would make the biggest difference for them is community. Mm. And I think that's something uh, religions actually have figured out more than the spiritual community and personal development. Because people, uh, when people try to be spiritual on their own, which I think is ironic, because the whole idea of spiritual is to connect. Yes, yes, <laughs> that is funny. You <laughs> meditate for yourself, by yourself for 10 hours and you don't talk to anybody. I don't think that's very spiritual. But that's, that's my perspective. So, um, yeah. so I think in terms of community, it's about not just doing personal development programs, it's about bringing your friends and your family to some of those programs. It's about sharing those programs and doing them together with your friends. And not just so you can do them together and have a common shared experience that would, you can relate to and talk about and do exercises, but then so you can be accountable to each other and hold mm -hmm. each other to that standard. Mm -hmm. My best friends are all people who are into personal development and love personal development because we help each other to maintain that standard and that integrity and that com commitment and that discipline. And, um, and I know for some people it's harder than others because their family or their friends may be totally against it. They might think it's mm -hmm. weird or, or whatever they think. I would say don't, uh, don't let that be your excuse not to create community because you can find community inside those programs. When you go to that program, make sure you talk to enough people to make new friends who are already right. into the personal development. Right. And, and, and that is so important. That's that's mm -hmm. part of the reason why we even have this and we mm -hmm. keep looking at new ways of expanding our reach in our community so that we get more information to those who we know are looking to us to help, you know, shape and form and gather the amazingness that is us mm -hmm. and are truly who we are. Like that's that's part of the reason why we have this forum and have people like you on to inspire yeah. others. Um, but I have another question for you. So we know that you go out and you inspire thousands, probably even millions at this point. What actually do or who do you turn to or how do you get inspired? Well, I get inspired from always looking for cutting edge uh, people and uh, programs and personal development. I don't stop being a student. And uh, even though, you know, I, I mean, there's been times that I've, I've been into different personal development programs over the years some of them for many years, five or ten years, and, and there comes a point where I uh, have listened to the same kind of program so much that uh, even though I'm still getting a little bit from it, I want, I want to get, I want to see a program where I'm getting a lot more from. So I'm all kind of changing it up, keeping it fresh, and um, that helps me to get it in different modalities, to get it from people with different uh, skill sets and different expertise, also from different geographies, get it from people from different cultures to so get more of a, a world perspective um, and also to get into di from different mediums so not just to do it on audio uh, on my iPhone but to do, watch videos to go to live events and then to have relation mentor relationships uh, mastermind relationships um, and, and then also from a spiritual perspective to um, being conscious of my own thoughts and then having a, a, a connection or communication with the universal source. Mm. That's really good. No, I love that you mentioned that, Dinesh, that you never stop being a student mm. because I think that's so key is that, you know, how we stay inspired and how we grow as a, as a person is just through learning. Um, and there's always something new to learn. So I think that's a great way and a great advice to share to people that, grow in some way and by seeking out those different sources that's one way to do that yeah and uh, the other point that I just love is about um, you know going if you're going out and you're you're the constant student like making new friends at wherever you're going to learn more to grow more um, and and making friends through those types of events that you're going to and and that's one way to make sure that you know there is alignment because they're there for something too they're there to make themselves or get themselves to, to expand mm -hmm. and so you are already know that you know you share something in common and it's great 
um, to meet people and, and not be afraid of people. That's actually um, another question that I had. Like, what advice would you give to people? I know I meet a lot of people, and I'm always out there. And like you, Danish, I stand out. People comment on my hair. If I had a nickel for every time somebody stopped me about my hair, I'd be rich right now. <laughs> um, but what advice do you give to people who you know, are afraid to, let's say, go up and approach somebody and just say, hi, I'm, you know, I'm Tosh. Nice to meet you. <laughs> like, what what advice? Because I know your story. There's a story um, for all of you watching. There's a story that Danish tells in one of his uh, videos, speaking videos, and he talks about going up to the lady on the subway. It's one of my favorite stories. <laughs> um, after you had been sitting there and like, oh, do I go up? Do I say something to her or not? And then you used one of your bookmarks that you had to go up and talk to her. But what's your advice that you give to people to make that first step when they're trying to meet, you know, make friends and expand their networks? Well, first of all, you know, just to relate to people, I, I, I know it's challenging. It's not easy. There's, there's something you, you can't put your finger on that stops you, even though you told yourself an hour before you want to do it. You, you get to the event, you, and, 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 and in your mind you're going to do it, but somehow it, it doesn't happen. And, and why not? Um, I think, well, first of all, practice helps. People will try that once and say, well, it's too difficult. <laughs> everything is everything is too difficult the first time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so first first to be okay with that it's difficult the first time or the first ten times. And that it might take twenty times, twenty different events for you to get the, the courage or the habit or the, the discipline, the willingness, whatever it takes, is gonna is not gonna come to you the first time. Mm -hmm. Um and um you know, sometimes I think relating to people who have it much more difficult helps. It, I mean, different things work for different people. But if relating to some somebody that has it more difficult helps, you know, I can share how difficult it is for me when I can't see the other person. You know, a great way to relate to someone when you're approaching them is to notice what they're wearing and to compliment them on something about them, uh, or to relate to them about the venue, like you know, this is you know, great paintings on the wall or a great architecture. Um, all those things I can't do. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm wow. gonna make it up. <laughs> I, 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 I gotta be inauthentic. You know, you look great. But <laughs> 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 In fact, you know, I, I, I just do. One time, I remember I was at the speaking. Um, I was at this event where I was watching a, a keynote speaker, and I was in the buffet lineup. And you know, I want to talk to people, but, but I would need to find something to relate to, which is, by the way, keys. You got to find so the easy way is to find something in common, right. and then talk about that. Right. And that makes it really easy because they're going to be receptive because it's something in common, something that they, it's something that's recent, or or the event that you're at. So what I did is we just watched a keynote speaker. So I'm standing in line with somebody, and I say to them, you know, that keynote speaker was kind of boring, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> And she says, she says, I was that keynote speaker. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, I remember one time I was, I was, you know, you know I, because I try, I try to pretend I can, I can see a little bit. So I said to one woman at another event, I said, you know, I, I like that nose ring you have. And she said, that's a pimple. Oh, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> Tony Robbins said, you know, one day you're going to look at these things and laugh, so you might as well laugh right there. And so, exactly. You know, that's, that's all you can do. But see, even when you have a situation like that where you're maybe you know, embarrassed for a moment, you still create a connection. <laughs> you do. You still get out of your comfort zone and you still meet someone new. And that's fun. You know, that process of whether you're uncomfortable or embarrassed or um, that's the different emotions of life. And yes. not to say, I don't want those things, just to say, how do I have those things in a way that empowers me and that makes me feel good and that nourishes my soul and that allows me to be more as opposed to res resist all of that. Right. Well, see, I see it in, in very similar. It's like, you know, you you walk away with a story like that and you end up making somebody's day because those two stories. 
<laughs> They're awesome. <laughs> Oh boy, and and that's the and and that's one of the things that we talk about a lot as well, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I I do uh, daily um, uh, like Google Hangouts like this as well, and one of the things I talked about earlier is I had a weekend this past weekend where I didn't get anything done. I I walk around with to do lists every day, and I didn't touch one single thing on my list for the weekend. And you know, our first reaction as people is to then start beating yourself up and saying, oh, I'm so awful, I can't believe I didn't do any of this, I didn't get to it, and start making yourself wrong. And so I, it hit me that, you know, okay, hold on, I'm going to do what I can, because that's all I can do at the moment, and I'm going to reach out to those who, you know, I need to get things to, and it turned out that it wasn't so bad, but, you know, we <clears throat> tend to sometimes make things out, like, for instance, you know, um, approaching that person on the subway who we, we think is really interesting and could possibly, you know, be someone who could be a new friend, we build these events up in our head to be so big and so momentous, and it's like, oh, if I don't do this, I'm going to pass out, and it's like, <laughs> life doesn't work that way. It's, no. you know, we, we build it up to be so much more in our head than what it actually is when we execute on these things. Um, so... Um, that leads to my next question. So, I, you you have all these projects on the go, and you complete so much. What what do you do, and what advice could you give to people who are at that point where you know they have all these things they want to accomplish, but they're seeing them too significantly? How do you keep things in perspective and just do it? Um, learn to live in the moment, um, mm. and and to. Um, Go with your heart and uh, do what you love, and you'll know what to do next. And mm -hmm. uh, when, when you just utilize your intuition and your insight, and the best part about that is you'll enjoy it a lot more. Rather than doing something out of obligation uh, or responsibility, although those two things are important, um, it's much better to do things out of passion and ease and fun. Um, why you keep your obligations and you remain responsible? <laughs> <laughs> Is that possible? Is that really possible? One <laughs> of those contradictions in life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's possible over time because over time what you do is you architect your life where your responsibilities and your obligations are the things that are fun and you're passionate about. That, that leads us to uh, the next question that I wanted to hit on because our slogan is, this is a place where you can find out how to be healthy, wealthy, and hot. So let's get to the wealthy part. We know that you know, you, you ha you're an entrepreneur and you do a lot of speaking engagements and you've got this app. So how did you transition from you know, doing or wanting to do what other people do to creating this, this foundation, this business? Um, and doing what your what I, I believe your passion is. This is you know working with people and helping people and teaching people. Well, it, it wasn't um, an easy transition, and I don't, you know I don't think any transition is easy. I was in IT before, and I was making uh, really great money in IT, and I was blessed that way. But when I when the dot com bubble burst, and I wanted to make personal development into my my career, it wasn't that I had all these businesses all of a sudden. It was, um, but it was taking action despite not even knowing what to do. In fact, one of the first actions I did is uh, well, I, I wrote my book and then because I was so eager and excited, I wasn't the type of person to, to research all the different options. I'm just a person of path and least resistance. Let me just try to get my book published and the first person that says yes, they're going to love they're gonna love me because I'm going to be all over it. And and so what I, I did that, and that was somewhat, I say somewhat of a mistake because you know, there, I don't think there are any mistakes. It's just what you do and what you don't do. Uh, and I'm glad I did that. But some people will say it was a mistake because it was a, a vanity press that were basically, you know, they basically charged me half the money to print the book. And, and based on understanding the business afterwards, 
I couldn't make any money on it because retailers want 50%. So you're paying 50% of the publisher or 50% of the retailer, it means you're making zero. Right, right. So, you know, not understanding the numbers and being, you know, innocent in that uh, industry, that was a mistake. But I don't think it was a mistake because I love doing it. I got my book out and then I learned and then I, I found another publisher that uh, was, was not a vanity publisher and, and then I self-published and I made money through my book that way. Um, so I forget what your question was now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, so did I. <laughs> so we flow, we go with things. That's a great story. We found out that you published two books or yeah. even more. How many books yeah. did you end up publishing? <laughs> well, I, 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 only, I actually only published uh, two books. I wrote a third, but uh, what happened by that time is I realized there wasn't that much money in publishing books. <laughs> No, again, I'm, because you know your path always changes in life, and it wasn't, yeah. that doesn't mean people shouldn't do books. What, what, um, you know, for, for me, what I realized, it was, it was a great way to get into the speaking business. In fact, that's why I wrote the book. I didn't write the book because I wanted to be an author. I only read three books in my life, so I was very resistant <laughs> at first. I was like, how can I be an author when I hardly ever read? <laughs> but... But I heard Mark Victor Hansen say on the tape when I wanted to be a speaker, he said, people don't hire speakers, they hire experts. Yes. So you, you get a book yes. published, not yes. to make money, uh, but not to make money directly. You do it so you can get speaking gigs, and that's where you make your money. Um, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, you know, there was many years where I was uh, not making money in personal development as a career or, or losing money. And um, you know it takes it takes years to build up uh, a business that's self-sustaining. I mean, for any business, yes. let alone the 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 best opportunity that a lot of people have, of, or like I did, is running them from home on a laptop computer. <laughs> 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 Internationally, I mean, one of my favorite moments was when I was in in China doing a book tour, and um, it was great because my book got translated to Mandarin, and I was, and I love to travel, so I love nice. be, being there. But I realized that my business, I sent out a newsletter every two weeks, and and I be coaching, and none of that stopped. None of that was affected because all my work was done through my laptop, which now was in China, and people didn't know that I was in China. Right. Uh, but but my business just still ran perfectly, so it was great. That's amazing. And and you touched on something earlier which I really wanted to, to you to speak on because even Siobhan and I have had these discussions. One of the challenges as, as an entrepreneur um, and as you know a, a leader and stepping into that role is getting used to calling yourself an expert. And um, I talk about this amongst my friends all the time because we're right at that that point where we're ready to move into that. What helped you actually own that title? Because I own my title. I call myself that health and wellness expert. But what what helped you to own it? Because in order for us to, you know, do our speaking engagements and do our book tours and book signings and all this stuff, then we have to own it. So what helped you move into that title of calling yourself an expert? Well, I thought it was really easy for me because uh, because I can't see, so I have no way of visually communicating with people. Uh, or seeing their visual communication to me, and there's tons of that. I mean, people don't realize how visual a society is. Mm. Uh, I mean, even just to try to go to uh, a fast food place, they don't even have any paper menus, and I can't see the menu on the wall. So I never know wow. what today's deal is. I don't know what any of the prices are. I don't even know what's available until I have memorized what they have available. So communication, um, all, all the other ways we communicate in terms of verbal communication, um, um, and, and and body language became so much more uh, important and significant for me to be effective at because necessity is a mother of invention. If I don't have a way of communicating visually, then I have to be more effective at communicating audibly um, in words. And so I learned to utilize my words much more powerfully so they have a bigger impact and, and my communication lands because I'm missing the other paradigm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
So I will make sure that everybody who's <laughs> asked that question watches and knows. It, it's so important for, um, especially in the, the type of work that we do for personal development and, and coaching and leadership, um, that, that we have that um, that connection and that uh, that confidence to say yes I do know and yes I do practice developing my skills and you know yes I can you know help you in the situation so that's yeah. that's great. The other, the other thing I think I, I have in terms of uh, an advantage of being an expert is because I uh, don't see visually I also don't get distracted by a lot of the um, visual advertising that happens. Ah, most, yes. Most people walk around and they're getting all these messages all the time with billboards and yes. things in transportation and um, and magazines. Yes. And I don't get I don't get any of that. And not only do I not get any of that, but then my mind is idle to think about things mm. that are about personal development. And if I'm not going to think about uh, well, Beyonce at the Super Bowl, then yeah. <laughs> all those, something you can't help, right? Yeah. <laughs> that is on everybody's it's mind, mind right now. Today. That's right. No, but that's such a good point because it's like we do get so distracted by everything that's happening. And I think to your point, Tash, about, you know, owning that whole expert title because there's so many distractions and so many people out there claiming the title of what expert what an expert is and what an expert isn't, it's easy to kind of get caught up in that, okay, am I an expert? Like, do I have to qualify myself in some way? But, you know, I love what you're saying, Dinesh, in the sense is that you have something, you've, ta you've tapped into what's special about you, mm -hmm. and that can make you an expert. And I think that's really what I think it comes down to for people is like tapping into what it is that you know and what's special, and how can you convey and teach that to somebody else. Yeah, an expertise is just someone who chose to focus on something specific for a period of time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, any, anyone, and most people don't. Uh, in yeah. their, I mean, maybe as a student in university they do, but uh, as adults, most people, uh, they, they spend their time on their job. So if someone who's listening has an addition to be having a job, they're spending an hour, or two, or three hours a week on some other passion or art or interest, then over a period of two or three or four years, they are an expert. On that passion or that art or their interest. Yeah, and and what do you think is is oh, are some of the reasons for well, I guess being bombarded with visual stimulation and buy this, go here, do this, mm -hmm. be here. That kind of makes it you know easier to be distracted because you're like I, I watched a video today just before um, the show actually, and it was saying it was asking the question, what are screens doing to us? And it pretty much just showed the day in the life of this guy. And, um, you know, he's at home first thing in the morning. It's breakfast time. He's sitting on his laptop. He gets <laughs> up. He grabs his smartphone. And as soon as he leaves, his daughters, his two little daughters and, and his wife go and sit in front of the TV. And he goes to work just to sit on a laptop. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. And this is this it's is reality. The society we are in. How <laughs> do we reality. stop this crazy? Not to say to stop it all together, because if we did, uh, none of us here would have a business. <laughs> yeah. But how, how do we get people more engaged in, in seeing that there's life beyond the screens? Well, I just want to play devil's advocate for a second because I like to. <laughs> 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 and to say that, you know, all those things about looking at screens, I would say it's in it, in of, it, of itself, it's neither bad or good. I think many things in life are neither bad or good. It's how people use them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it's money or religion um, or, or drugs, um, it, all these things in life, they, every technology can be used in a good way and can be used in a bad way. And I think us as entrepreneurs, we generally know how to use it in a good way yes. because because you know we leverage technology to build businesses and make a difference for people as opposed to being addicted to it where we can't be at dinner with somebody and we need to look at our, our iPhone instead of being present with the person we're having dinner with. Right. Um, so I think that the, the bigger distinction is not what are we doing, but how are we doing it. And, and if we're doing it in a way that's uh, fun and uh, co-creative 
and engaging, causing us to grow, then I think that's a beautiful thing. And I think lots of people who do use technology a lot, particularly, now I hear a lot of people who don't use Facebook, they say bad things about Facebook. It's funny, when people don't do something, they say bad things about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> but, you know, all the people, that, that, I mean, not all, but I mean, a lot of the people I know that use Facebook get great value from it. They're not you know, on it uh, you know, in a way that I think is detrimental um, to them. I think it's actually enriching for them, particularly when I see a new generation of people where... Uh, for example, my, um, you know, my uh, some people in my family we may not communicate that regularly, but I'm on Facebook and I and I and I'm aware of what they're up to, and that constant awareness of what they're up to of people I love and know will have me be triggered to maybe uh, do something with them and 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 get more involved, or even the next time I see them, I can relate to them because I know what they've been going through in their life. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you, you you just made the best di distinction that I could have and I'll make sure we get it uh, uh, translated in part of this video and that's it's you know the the technology itself or, or the screens themselves aren't good or bad it's what we use them for and and how you know how we utilize them in and, and that's what's important Wow mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little speechless right now Siobhan you want to <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Dinesh, like you, you obviously you've had like an amazing, you know, journey and path, and that you're using your voice now to help inspire others. Like, and you mentioned and you alluded to a time like when you experienced bullying and things like that. Like, do you have any advice for somebody who might be experiencing that and how they can maybe, you know, see the light in the end of the tunnel, or maybe share a little bit about how you dealt with that during that that, that time? Yeah, I think. The, the the thing to do, the thing that someone can choose to do, that would make the bit, I think, the biggest difference for them, in that kind of adversity, is simply to share that adversity, to share what's happening to them and what they're going through, and even they can share it with their their family, and they can share it with their friends, they can share it with their uh, peers at school, they can share it with their teacher. They can share it with their guidance counselor. They can share it online. They can share it in forums. They can share it on social networks. They can share it through spontaneous conversations. So those are just nine things that came out of the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> but you can, so many times people hear something like share, and they think, oh, my family's not interested, or they don't, they're, yeah. they'll get upset or something. And there's always, some, there's always someone who would have an open ear to that. Mm -hmm. And out of sharing something happens in self-creation, where we get to notice and observe how we are, how we're being, and maybe how the other person is, is how they're being, and, um, and then just out of that consciousness, new possibilities open up. You don't even meet the other person to even really say anything, although sometimes they might give you good direction or, or relate to you and help you feel good or, or give you advice, but the, all that is secondary. What's important is self-expression. I think one of the four human traits is that we need to feel self-expressed, and we feel most uh, at um, in diversity, adversity, and in depression when we're not sharing what's going on. And we, and then what happens is, well, because we're not sharing it, we think we're the only one going through it, mm. and that's what feels the worst. But yeah. as you share with other people, yeah. what you realize is that you know people might not be going through the same adversity. But we're all human beings on this journey together, and we all have different lightning strikes in, in our lives. And when we become present to that, our adversity doesn't go away, but somehow we find more of more energy or more determination to transcend it, to rise above it. And at the minimum, sometimes to, to accept it, because maybe it's something that was in the past is not there currently. We're just making it an issue because it was so adverse in the past. Or maybe it's something that's not local. And yet again, it's, you know, people make drama of things that are not necessarily present or relevant to their lives. Um, and sometimes they are. Like I mean, for me, I mean, blindness is totally relevant and present. But then it's it's the more I shared that adversity with people like my friends, what happened? is they became more 
aware of it, so they, they tried to uh, work with me on, on things that they could, or they, they just listen. And sometimes just that listening makes people yes. feel connected. Yes. And an, authentic, an authentic ear from a good friend is sometimes the most powerful tool. And, and on that note as well, I, sometimes it doesn't even need to be a friend. And I know one of the things that happens to me quite often on the weekly basis, if not on a daily sometimes, where um, perfect total strangers, never saw them before, can get from me that they'll get an acknowledgement for who they are right now, right here, and will share some crazy stuff. I mean, I've had people share, you know, relationship issues that I'm sure they've never told anybody, mm -hmm. even the people they were dealing with. And it's because when you're receptive to people 100% as they are right now, because it's, it's not as common yet, but it's going to get common, but <laughs> it's not as common yet. So when you allow, you create that space for safety, for acknowledgement, for people to just be free and be who they are, they feel it. And, and I know in what I do, I, I try to teach people, you know, just how to be open and receptive and accepting people just as they are. Not saying, oh, well, I wish this person was this way, but they're not. Mm -hmm. So acknowledge them how they are and see them as they are and love them as they are because that's what people, mm -hmm. that's, that's the power of connection. When you're connected with people, you get that and people feel safe and they feel that connection and they're willing to open up and so the relationship develops and uh, it's a gift to be in the presence of people who do that. It's, it's amazing. Another strategy to do that, to create more connection, is just simply to be conscious of asking more questions. Mm -hmm. just, and, and then be silent and wait for the answer. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no matter how long it takes, because sometimes the longer it takes, the more of an interesting answer you're going to get. True. Yeah. Very true. And, and also probably the real answer, too. Because sometimes, answer, yeah. Yeah. sometimes yeah. right away it doesn't come out, but as you yeah. keep talking, that's when the, the truth comes out. Or yeah. sometimes it's, it takes follow-up questions because yes. people are resistant in there, especially with people they don't know or trust. Yeah. They are not going to give you a straight answer, first of all. So, but don't make that mean that they don't want to tell you the answer. Right. It just means you got to work at it. When yes. you to, and and, and, and as, as, then it's about rephrasing the question, or asking the question in a different way, and, or, or asking a broader question, or, mm -hmm. um, you know, not making it personal making it more of a, of a philosophical question. But all those things are, are ways of, of connecting with people because you're allowing them to be self-expressed by asking them a question. Most people like to talk, and so they don't allow the other person to be self-expressed because they're not leaving any space for them to ask, answer any questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so remember to leave space, <laughs> ask a question, and pause. Just let yeah. it come. <laughs> a great question is also, because uh, lots of great questions, and you know, some questions are better than others. But one question I love to ask is, what do you love about your life today? And wow. what happens when you ask people that question is, you know, one thing I learned about questions is you know, sometimes it's very strategic because you can actually, by asking a question a certain way, cause people to feel a certain way. And when you ask yes. that kind of question with authenticity and with, um, uh, with commitment, you, you cause the other person, even if they're feeling depressed, even if they've had a really bad week, mm -hmm. they're going to consider that. And out of their consideration, their whole state can change. Yes. I love okay. that. Question. I love. I love it too. I'm just like, what do I love? I life? know. Right? <laughs> and, and as Tony Robbins would say, if someone says nothing, you rephrase the question to say, what could you love about your life if there was something that you could love? Mm. And all of a sudden, people—it's so funny. Just that not rephrasing, people yeah. become more open because yeah. now, it, it, again, it's more of a philosophical question. It's not exactly. about forcing them to feel a certain way. Yes, That's I love that because question. like what do you love makes them realize, hey, there are some good things and if they don't if they can't think of something, the whole what could you love, could you love? makes yeah. you start thinking, hey, like this is the what I desire and it takes them out of that. So 
Mm-hmm. Fantastic. I love those questions. I'm going to probably use them for myself. Yeah, we're, we're going to make sure they're in the video and people see them because they're wonderful. <laughs> and on that note, it, it time has flown. The hour is up. My goodness. Danish, before we close out, is there any final message you want to give to our viewers? Yes. Um, we talked before about community. And so I want to encourage them to be part of, of your community because you have a great show here and to be part of our community, my community. I mean, our communities are going to intersect and integrate soon. Oh, yes, but, they are. For sure. <laughs> for, sure. But for my community, uh, you know, whatever medium you prefer, uh, I have a Facebook page, which people get uh, visual, cool, inspirational stuff um, uh, throughout the day. And I also have uh, ways we can make money together, like the Inspired Living app. If you're interested in that and being in a community of people who watch and promote personal development material, then check that out. It's on my website at uh, ordinarywords.com slash living. That's www.ordinarywords dot com slash L-I-V-I-N-G. Ordinarywords.com slash living. Or you can phone me directly. I'm available at 647-439-5011. And finally, uh, if you figured out telepathy, Give me a call because I want to talk that way too. <laughs> well, Danish, we'll make sure that all of those links are available for people to, yeah. to, to click on as well. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to use this uh, format. Again, we've had Danish Ahmed, motivational speaker, world traveler, author, entrepreneur, just all around amazing person join us today. And again, thank you so much, Danish, for joining Siobhan and I. You're welcome. It was a pleasure, and I look forward to another session. Yes, yes and we'll sure. be back. We've got amazing Siobhan. What do we have coming up, or can we leave that until a little bit later? We'll see that a little bit later. We do have uh, late. I can give a little teaser that we have uh, a hockey player um, this yes. month coming <laughs> on board, um, talking about vegan lifestyle. Just as a hint for that. And uh, we have some other folks that are going to be joining us, really exciting uh, nutritionists, somebody who is an entrepreneur that helps people who are working full time and want to start a business. So uh, stay tuned to the Hot and Holistic Facebook page and all details will be posted. And as we mentioned at the top of the hour, like we'd love to hear your feedback on this new platform. So we'll post the details there. Awesome. And thank you, Danish, so much. This has been an awesome awesome conversation. Amazing. It was hot and holistic. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> it was. True definition. It is. Awesome. Thanks yes. again, everybody, for joining us. We hope you enjoy. This is now going on our newly created YouTube channel, so join us again next week, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Mondays for Hot and Holistic, and have an amazing evening. Great. Thank you. Let's Bye. love the world Bye. together. <laughs> <laughs>